So this material that I'm going to be covering tonight is not uh, material that I assembled myself. Uh, my friend Gary Bennett, who I met over many years in polishing the pulpit, uh, is very into Jewish history. And he has taken people on many trips over to Jerusalem and, and those areas. And he has made friends with some Jewish rabbis over there and learned much of the first century history. Once you get him outside the first century history, he's, he, you know, he, he's not as aware, but he is very fluent in the first century time period. I heard him give this lesson and I asked him if I could use it uh, when I go out on the road. And so he actually helped me uh, as I assembled it. And he would uh, uh, tell me, oh, because I took notes when I, when I did that. And, and he said, well, tweak this, tweak that. You know. so, so this is it. And I think this, for me, opened up my eyes to a lot of the parables and many of the things that Jesus said. So there are about 11 steps uh, in the process of the marriage, the engagement, and then the actual wedding that you get to. The Jews believe that when Noah is given the demand to be fruitful and multiply and refit, I just started. I just started. So. <laughs> Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Uh, Jews view that as the first command. And marriage is seen as, a, as an institution from God, which it is. Marriage is a beautiful thing in the way that God intended it. And so as we go through here. So first of all, there's a selection of the bride. So the bride doesn't go out selecting a husband, but uh, the groom's father will, first of all, be involved in the process of selecting a bride for his son. And the father will select a bride that he feels is uh, from a good family, uh, that they were a faithful family, and for his son. And then uh, the factors, as I just mentioned, are the family. And then, of course, financial factors. Uh, are they trying to you know, marry above? their financial ability to uh, ask the bride's hand in marriage because there are several factors. In the first century, the groom did have an input. And when you think about when Isaac, uh, he was not involved in the selection of his own bride. You see, Abraham sent his servant back to uh, where he was from. And then we see that uh, his servant was the one that found the family, Abraham's uh, relatives, and that uh, Rebecca uh, was there at the well. The servant, that's a good story to, to analyze because the servant wanted to do the right thing. He wanted and he prayed to Abraham's God, he said to pray that he would find the right woman. When he, she is brought back, uh, Isaac is in love, uh, and, and, as you read about that. And really, I think our society has failed uh, because we allow you know, the younger people to try to choose their own mates. And the purity of marriage has suffered in that. And uh, it shouldn't be like a smorgasbord where you try different things to see if you like it. So there's going to be a price for the bride. And there's good reasons for this. 
And it's not, uh, you know, a lot of times you see in the movies the dowries and everything. Uh, there, there is a reason for this. A lot of times in Jewish society, and you read through the Bible, when the men are getting married, there could be 15 to 20 years age difference in the man. And a lot of times you see that the men die and the, their uh, wives are widowed. But depending upon their families, the age of their children, when the father dies, uh, then the woman might, you know, could be taken care of by some of their own children. So they have to decide on fair compensation. So the the bride's family is losing a worker in that household. They're going to be losing a worker. So, you know, kids didn't sit around on, on their phones and watching TV and these things. They were part of a household where uh, they did not have electric appliances, where the work was difficult uh, to uh, dress an animal for, for food kinds of things. So uh, that family had to be compensated for that loss. They may have to hire a servant to replace that person. So fair compensation. And then a dowry has to be uh, decided upon. A dowry is basically life insurance if the husband dies and she's left a widow that she could live out the rest of her days uh, on that. When you look through the, the time of the Old Testament, as you get up into the New Testament, one thing that you don't really see a lot of is inflation. Uh, the price of things don't, like, you know, in the 1950s, you know, you watch some of these old programs, and the price of meat, the price of gas is very inexpensive. It's less than the tax that you pay on, uh, you know, a gallon a gallon, you know, for for fuel today. And you know, bread was you know like a nickel a loaf, and uh, in many cases. And you know, today, you know, some of the bread at the store, if you don't get a day old bread, it can be five six dollars if it's considered premium. So uh, they could gauge. How, you know, if the husband might die and that she's going to be a widow for so many years, they could have a pretty good gauge on how much uh, that money would last, uh, you know, because of the day's wages was uh, pretty well set. Then they draw up a ketubah, and a ketubah is the marriage contract. So there would be a contract between the two families. So the father of the groom and the father of the bride get together and they do the haggling and uh, drawing up this contract. Uh, the contract would basically be the, the outline of procedures. It would outline the time, and when I say time, uh, it's a general time. Uh, you know, we think of, well, this is going to happen at 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. on Monday night, and, you know, that's the time to be there. Uh, not everything was that ingrained in stone. We, we didn't become uh, servants of time really until the railroad schedules came out. And, you know, we had to be at a certain place at a certain time, you know. So, uh, Time is a relative term in these days. It's still relative in sense after. Oh, yeah. So, so the place, and the place is typically going to be at the groom's father's house, almost, almost always. Uh, the size, and that would be important uh, because you want the best for the two children, and so. Um, the groom's father is going to be bearing a big brunt of the expense, and then of course the dowry. Then there's going to be promises of the groom to the bride, uh, what he 
will provide for her uh, in financial terms, in uh, a domicile where they're going to live, and basically uh, their relationship to God. Then he's going to have a list of expectations that he expects from her. Uh, he's not going to change the diapers, you know, things like that. But uh, even at a more spiritual level, uh, his expectations of his wife. Uh, now, in the first century, the bride could say no. She could say, no, I'm not going to do that. And uh, from what Gary has studied and told me, uh, now that was not always the case, but even when uh, Rebecca was at the well and Laban and everyone got involved with whether or not she would go, uh, the choice was finally up to her if she went. Step four is the bride's consent. So she will decide, and once she then decides, uh, this is going to be a contractual engagement. So she would be given, once she says yes to the engagement, a ring with a declared value. And in the Jewish eyes, even though the marriage has not happened, even though they are not living together, even though this is, in our eyes is only an engagement, they are together. So to break this contract is, is nearly like a, a divorce at this point. Yes, sir? Is, would that be similar terminology of being betrothed? Yes. They hadn't come together yet? Yes. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, in Hugo McCord's translation, he translates uh, the, the betrothal as uh, Joseph, his fiance. Uh, and he does translate it like that. So she will be given a veil with 10 coins that go around the head. And these 10 coins are 10 pieces of silver. And uh, I guess it was traditional that all the women uh, received such a, a, a veil. These ten points, I think, were part of your dowry, which that was most everybody at least got that much. But it was a symbol. If you recall in Luke chapter 15, and going to verse 8, and it, the parable of the lost coin, and it's a woman that has lost, she had ten pieces of silver, she loses one, and she searches diligently, and she's very upset that she's lost this point, and she searches until she finds it. When she finds it, she lets her neighbors know, and she's so excited. These ten pieces of silver represented that everything is okay at home. Uh, only her husband could take one of those pieces of silver from her, and uh, it was only the husband that could do it, and it was usually that the, the bride has not kept her vows. If her husband suspected her of uh, uh, flirting, uh, casting her eyes a certain way to, to, to another man, uh, he could take one of those away from her. And it would have been a shameful thing. And you would not have wanted to go out in public with less than 10 coins and go to the market. Uh, remember the Samaritan woman? And I'm not saying that she followed the Jewish customs, but she went to the well when no one else was around. The other women weren't there. And, uh, and she'd been married uh, seven times, right? And the one number seven wasn't her husband. So the bride um, could have one of those taken away. So it brings, uh, when I heard this the first time, I was like, you know, because before, I'm thinking in financial terms, well, you still have nine pieces. You only lost 10%. So 
So why are you so upset? But this is something that ties to her vows. And if she's lost one, it wasn't taken away from her. She's lost it. And, you know, it shows us God's concern for, and Jesus' concern for one that is lost. And so he uses that parallel. And typically it uh, was an identification of infidelity. So it, it was a pretty, you know, significant thing if that was uh, one of those was taken away. So then is they are betrothed. And so the next steps in this is they are legally bound. And so to break this would be like a, a divorce even though the marriage ceremony has not yet taken place. So then the gifts are exchanged and given to the bride and she's given the, the dowry and so they know the, the, the amount and all of that that is uh, there together. Then they would share a glass of wine and they would declare a covenant between that man and woman. And I think of Jesus and his disciples uh, there at the Passover meal. And he says, take drink. This is my blood of the new covenant. My blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Uh, when we have that communion with the Lord, and if you remember, he said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine with you until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And Jesus did not partake of anything and, uh, at the cross or at the high priest's house. He refused uh, to drink. And even if it was bad wine, he would not, and it came to his lips, but he refused. And so I, I think about that. And I think we can sometimes be like the Israelites where we go through the motions of the communion without thinking of the significance that it is with, with our communion with Christ and partaking of that and showing that we are part of his body. And, you know, we see that Paul really got onto the, the Corinthians for, for taking the communion service and making it into a party and not something of that significance because you know we're talking about Jesus giving his life upon the cross. Step seven. We're going through these pretty quickly here, so if you have any comments on I'll, I'll take those. Uh, so then the bride will go to a mikvah. And the mikvah is a pool and many mikvahs were in Jerusalem and many were uh, around the temple area, but also throughout the city. They had mikvahs uh, last night at the, uh, at the Qumran, at the Dead Sea, where the Essenes were at, and we saw those pictures of the mikvahs there. And so she would go to the mikvah, and we might call it baptism. She would be immersed, which it is an immersion, and there would be a, a stewardess uh, so another woman there to make sure that she went in and all part of her went into the water submerged. All of her hair would be under the water. And this was a symbol and it was a symbol of purification that uh, symbolized her virginity, symbolized uh, her cleanness for her new husband. And she is leaving her old way of life with her family. And she is coming to create a new household with her new husband. She's coming into a, a new time, a new birth uh, in, in doing that. So as you look at Ephesians chapter 5 and 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And it's a, just amazing to me that so many people, uh, if baptisms is what put you into the body, you know, if you look through the scriptures and you'll see that uh, belief uh, and you know, hearing first, but belief and then uh, confession and repentance, they are things unto salvation. They are bringing you closer. But it is the baptism that puts you into Christ. And it's a sad thing that, that so many of the denominational world will not uh, accept baptism as that which is washing away the sins. It's a symbolic thing. It's not the actual washing of the water, but it is a commitment that we are giving ourselves over to Christ and the symbolicness there. And it's a washing of water by the word. What does that mean? The washing of the water by the word. It is obedience. And that's all that God asked of the Israelites all through the Old Testament is that they obey. And that's what he's asking us is to obey. Uh, in Romans chapter 1 and then Romans chapter 16 you have uh, that book ended with uh, faith unto obedience or their obedience is spoken of throughout the whole world well that's interchangeable with faith is spoken of throughout the whole world and uh, that's what we're you know that's our relationship with Christ Did you know that Americans, when Americans went over to fight wars or Americans uh, are perceived by other countries, we are perceived as a lazy, fun-loving society because they think that all we want to do is just play and have fun. Our largest export in this nation has been Hollywood the last 20, 30 years. Movies is our biggest export. Movies are entertainment, aren't they? Now, you don't hear them say, well, our biggest export is movies. No, they look at real hard goods, and they don't put the movie industry as a whole. But it is. It's greater than uh, other things that we export. So, we need to take these things more seriously sometimes than, than what we do. Uh, you don't see a lot of jokes uh, written in the Bible. You see people say, well, I think God had a sense of humor. Uh, I think when it comes to salvation, God is very serious. There's no joking around with it. And, you know, and uh, you don't see Jesus joking with the rich young ruler, you know. Uh, and making it he, Jesus was was sorrowful that that man went away. So now, once the contract and these things are accomplished, it's a season of preparation. So the groom goes back to his father's house, and he is going to build a room uh, at his father's house. And now that's going to be his inheritance someday. But he will build a room or a dwelling on his father's property for him and his new wife to begin a family. Before leaving the bride, the bride will the bridegroom will state to the bride something similar to what Jesus tells his apostles at the Last Supper. He says, I go to prepare a room for you, a place. And I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. This was a statement, according to the research uh, Gary has done and talking to me, that they would say to the bride that I will come again, and when I get the, the dwelling finished. So the groom will return to his father's house and begin preparing. 
So then this begins the season of preparation. Now remember, the wedding, uh, we said that there would be a time and a place. So the place will most always be at the bridegroom's house, uh, where his father is. Now, the father is going to be overseeing his son's work on that room. And the groom's father will have the final say when everything is finished. And until he gives his final okay, the bridegroom cannot go pick out and pick up his bride. So the father of the bridegroom has the final say, and he will say when it's finished. The bridegroom doesn't know when that will be. So when they select a time, it's usually a, a season time. So it's sometime in that season that, that this room should, is supposed to be finished. It has a great parallel to what Jesus says in uh, Mark 13, 32, and 34. And uh, also, uh, when... Uh, Jesus is asked by the disciples, when will these things be? They had asked about, they had asked him three questions. Uh, when is the temple going to be destroyed? Uh, what will be the signs of his coming? And what will be the end of the age? And he answers those three questions uh, in Matthew chapter, help me out, uh, 24, 24. Okay, thank you. And uh, so, of that day and hour no man knoweth, no not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you know not what the time is. This, and you're going to see this, that when the bridegroom comes, everybody needs to be ready. So all this time, the bride will be anticipating when the bridegroom will come. Okay, so just think, keep that in mind. She's anticipating. So, as the wedding day nears and the father has given his okay uh, and the word has gone out that it will be on a certain day, the time that the bridegroom will come is still unknown. But it typically was at night. And it was to give, so the the. News would go out that it's going to happen on this day. So it's, a, it's going to be it's going to come on Friday. It's a, so it's going to be on Friday. Well, they don't know what time of day. But typically, in the first century, the bridegroom would come in the evening at night. It gave the bride uh, a last full day to be at home with her family. And it was out of respect uh, to the family of the bride. And uh, so the bride's been preparing and she will have 10 of her friends that have never been married that are virgins and it's almost always according to what uh, Gary has studied uh, at least 10 or more and these young women had lamps that were at, uh, affixed to a post and so the lamps were oil lamps, and they would light the way, the path of the bridegroom. Now remember the parable, the, there were five that were foolish and five that were wise, and the five had to go back into town because the others wouldn't share their olive oil with them to light the lamps because they didn't want to run out. And, and so uh, keep this in mind. Okay, so keep this in mind. And they had to be prepared. And so they needed to have enough oil to get through the darkness, to light the path out of respect for the bridegroom. The bridegroom's friends, when the father has, you know, of course given his okay, then the bridegroom will go out uh, and it will be uh, sometime in dark. And they would go out announcing the coming of the bridegroom. Think of when Jesus came into Jerusalem on the bull, the bull, the bull of an ass, and riding into Jerusalem, and the people yelling out, 
Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Jesus stopped and wept over the city of Jerusalem because they did not recognize, they didn't know. When the bridegroom gets to the house, the bride's father, uh, out of tradition, would look away. And so the tradition was that he was stealing away the bride from her father to create a, a new fossil. And so there's a symbolism there. Once everybody comes back and they, the bridegroom's friends are ahead announcing, they are walking together, the bridegroom, the bride, the uh, the virgins have their lamps and they are lighting along the way. Once that everybody gets into the place where the wedding will take place, the bridegroom's father's house most likely, the bridegroom's father will decide whether everyone should have been there. And he will shut the door and they will not let anyone else in. And it's out of privacy and respect of the marriage of the two. And the father of the bride, bridegroom is in control of that. And he will not let anybody else in during that time. You probably have heard at some point in your life maybe a sermon on and the doors were shut. And remember the five foolish virgins were not allowed into the wedding feast. They're told to go away. Then you have the full wedding ceremony where the, the man and woman will come together, and that's called Eusia, if I pronounce that right. And so it's the full wedding ceremony. And they will go under what is called a chupa. And it's like an umbrella or a canopy type of thing, and it is symbolic of a house that they will go under that they are becoming a family a man and woman and they will create a new household while they are under that they will uh, then uh, drink of the wine and a lot of times you see them interlock their their arms like a television and I suppose they do that but they will drink the wine. The groom will take the drink first. And then the bride to show that she is in subjection to her husband. Now, uh, that's a Jewish custom. But you see it roll over into uh, New Testament teaching that wives should be sub in subjection to their husbands within the church, the church structure. I didn't write it. The apostles wrote it, and that was the Jewish custom of the day uh, when Jesus taught. Remember, he said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink of the new fruit of my Father's kingdom. And uh, again, uh, I think I'm going to get ahead of myself, so I'm going to go ahead. So then they, after they drink the wine, they will say seven blessings unto God. You know, when today couples exchange their marriage vows, uh, typically there's something along the lines of uh, that they will remain faithful in sickness and health. But unfortunately, uh, we've kind of not put in being faithful to God or thanking God for the union and for God's blessings upon that union. Don't, don't, sometimes that get omitted. Uh, I think within the church there are some, still some gospel preachers that will do uh, something along those lines. But for the most part, I was asked, and I don't, I don't like to do weddings. Uh, I, I won't do weddings. I've done one wedding and they said I messed it up, so. Uh, <laughs> 
they said, you had uh, the bridegroom on the wrong side, and I said, I was just happy to get through, you know, because uh, I hadn't done one before, I didn't want to do one, and uh, as a preacher uh, these days, you know, there's just so much baggage uh, that, that, that comes along, and so I've just kind of removed myself. The other thing, if you have people from the outside asking, actually I did it two ways. Uh, uh, people from the outside asking you these things, especially in the state of Oregon, uh, if someone that wants to marry the same sex and you deny that, and so if I just say, I do not do weddings, period. Now they've made it easier in the state of Oregon uh, in, in a couple of respects, but they uh, also have taken the, the beauty, the godly beauty of the marriage out. Uh, in most states, I think this is still true, you have to be ordained or licensed by the state to do a marriage. Is that still true in most states? You have, in the state of Texas, you have to be licensed or ordained by the organization you're part of to perform weddings. Okay. Well, in Oregon, uh, the couple just go down and get their license, and they just need a witness to, to, to write on that license that they were married. So anyone in the state of Oregon can perform a wedding as long as they can sign their name. If you've got a dog that can sign its name, they will accept that. So if you can teach Fido somehow to make make that uh, and the state will, will accept it. And I mean, look at the institution of marriage. And think where it began. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. That the two shall become one flesh. A man shall leave his mother and father and cleave after his wife. The love that we are to have and that should exist throughout our marriage. And are there going to be tough times? You bet. Uh, you know, you've, you've got a family to raise. You've got a family to support. You've got a family to feed. Uh, as a team, you are a team. Whatever God has joined us under, do we ever, do we still think that way? That God has blessed us with God has caused these two to come together. And it's, we are dishonoring God when we flippantly uh, rotate the wheel of marriage and say, well, this one didn't work out, I'll try it again. After the seven blessings to God is given a glass the glass that the wine was in is thrown down to the ground and it is broken. In some cases it is stepped on, uh, but it is symbolic showing there's no going back. You know, you talk about uh, men or even women getting full feet on the day of their marriage, you know, and probably you'd have more of it today if uh, people honor the, the institution of marriage. Uh, because there comes that realization on the day of your marriage that this is forever. There's no, no going back if you're, you're going to be right in God's eyes. The old cannot be put back together again. And that is the symbol of that. Again, when the feast has uh, begun, the doors are kept shut. No one gets in. It can last for days. It's up to, uh, I guess, how long the food lasts. Uh, so these marriage, a marriage is the greatest day in the lives of a man and woman that come together. Oh, you can attend some weddings. But a wedding is something that people celebrate. They were happy for the two that come together. And it was something to be celebrated. Now, the bride and the groom go off 
after this part of the ceremony. But then the marriage feast can last. Remember in Matthew 22 when the story of the great wedding feast and the, the master, the, the bridegroom's father comes up and says, Friend, where is your wedding garment? Well, in the first century, the father of the bridegroom provided the garments. They got a new set of clothes to come to the wedding. Everybody, uh, that was part of the invitation. And you would receive that new set of garments. And so to show up at the wedding without that set of garments would be disrespect to the father of the bridegroom. And I used to think, well, what if this individual just didn't have the money to have the proper clothes? And I thought, well, that's kind of a hard, hard thing, you know. And no, the clothes were provided. And when you think of uh, the way the book of Jude ends, to present you faultless, Jesus presenting you faultless to his father and spotless. They had new white robes dipped in the blood of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. And that is the wedding garment that, that as Christians that we are seen as having in the eyes of God. Uh, James, uh, what's James' last name? Uh, in James Rogers, yeah. Did a series of lessons on Leviticus that falls from the pulpit over the course of about five years. It, it is one of the best lessons, sets of lessons on Leviticus. I mean, Leviticus is not one of those books you say, oh boy, I want to study Leviticus because there's a lot of hard stuff in there. He made it fun. And I just complimented him on what a great seven lessons and he one of the things that he said that kind of stuck with, with me that he says when God looks at us he sees the blood of Jesus that purifies us you know I used to have this game as a Jeopardy game and the answers were in a certain color and you couldn't see them they were kind of blended in and you had this little film that you would put over and then you could see the answer. And I, I kind of thought of that when I, that, you know, here we are sinful creatures and Jesus gave himself for us. That blood is precious unto God and it has cleansed us from our sins. And he suggested that when God sees us, he sees the blood of his son that purifies us. He's able to present you faultless in the presence of his father with God with exceeding joy. Revelation, come gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. I want to be there before the doors, doors get shut. I want to be ready. I don't want to be a foolish virgin. I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That is the church. The church. Which church? There's only one. Unfortunately, you know, if you look at a historical timeline, you look and you see the, the Catholic church going into apostasy. And people think, well, what happened to the church of Christ during all that time? Uh, my friend Greg Wesley, uh, who preached in Ashland, Oregon, until he retired and moved to Lubbock, Texas, to be near his children and grandchildren. Back in the early 2000s, we went over there and we were visiting. And he did a class. And in that class, he passed out a copy of a, one of the old gospel, uh, something like the Christian Courier of the day. And in there, there are these missionaries that 
went to Iraq, which you could do in those days, uh, without fear of being murdered. And the Muslims weren't doing uh, jihads in those days. So they went, and they their mission work wasn't going well. And they went up into the northern part of Iraq and Iran, up in the mountainous country up there, and they found a group of people that were meeting on the first day of the week. They were worshiping by singing, no company instruments. They had a lesson, and they heard scriptures, and they partook of the communion. They asked them, how do you know these things? Because they didn't have Bibles. And they said, the tradition is from our fathers that, and I believe it was Thomas, that they said, came through that area in the first century. Come on in. Uh, there's another lesson out of this. Uh, they went through that area, that apostle and taught their fathers and they had remembered and they knew much of many parts of the gospels they knew the life of jesus and there were verses that they could quote without ever seeing the written word and they worshiped as they had been taught and they kept that tradition just as they had in the first century until they had the written word later on the church has existed from the day of Pentecost in some part of this earth and there have been faithful followers but what I, my point was is even though the Catholic Church was the main religion and then there was the Reformation movement and then you get the Lutheran Church and then you get uh, others and you get uh, a, a small body of denominations then there are still those that are working for the truth. And it wasn't really until the beginning of this nation that you began to have so many denominations. Because this nation protected the freedom of religion and also did not tax churches. And so people use the umbrella of being a denomination to do their own thing, uh, some sincerely probably thought they were doing the right thing, but then there were those that during the restoration movement that were studying their Bibles, got back to the truth of the scriptures of the New Testament. I heard this, that the reason that the Church of Christ grew at a phenomenal rate uh, during the restoration movement is you had an area that was west of the Appalachian Mountains. People studied their Bibles. You don't want to have a labor day. It's because people complained because they were working 12 hours a day, didn't have sunlight when they got home to study their Bibles. And then they went to the eight hour day. And then what they do with the extra four hours? Well, it didn't last long that they studied their Bibles. But anyway. People studied their Bibles in that day, and people of those different denominations came together and saying, hey, we're reading in here that you need to be immersed. We're reading in here that it's not by faith only. We're, and they, got, they were disconnected from the head of their churches or the governance body, and they could read the Bible for themselves, and they're saying, hey, we're doing the wrong thing here. And they came together and uh, the church grew like wildfire. And until we could get people back and studying their Bibles and understanding it, uh, we're going to have a difficult time. And also respecting the beauty of the marriage of great arrangement and how uh, God sees that in his eyes. That Jesus died for the church and gave himself for it. He purchased the church. It's his bride, spiritually speaking. 